Awesome. So um, I'm going to talk about some older work and some current slash recent work today. Um, the older work was very much inspired by Timothy O'Sullivan and thinking around Timothy O'Sullivan and the work of his peers. Um, and I'll get into that in a minute. That's why you're looking at this screenshot from the Mets website. Um, that older work is called Here Now, and it's work that I did in grad school uh, that I have mixed feelings about. And um, I, I, even though I have mixed feelings about it, I like to show it, especially to other people who are working in photography. Um, and when I give talks at schools, I think it's important to show because there's there's a lot of mythology around the genius of the artist because all we ever get to see as viewers is what winds up um, in galleries and museums. You know, the things that people are asked to speak about, the things that we that many people can agree on is good. And those like little snips of the of the good work or the work that works is it's such a um, it's it's such a poor reflection, I think, of what actually goes on uh, in the process of making work. There's a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of failure, for lack of a better term. Um, and then there's work that does what you want it to do, but not quite. And um, you start to live with it, and then you kind of pick it apart. And there are days where you come back to it and you really love it, and then other days you come back to it and think, "What was I thinking?" So. I think it's important to show that work and talk about that work just because again, it's really important to me to demystify like the process of being an artist and kind of prove that it's like, it actually has nothing to do with the kind of genius. It's just about um, doing the work and like being persistent and holding yourself accountable. Um, so in addition to that older work, I'm gonna show a newer group of pictures um, that I hesitate to call a project anymore, uh, and I can get into that later on, but that group of pictures is called What Had Happened. And I showed that work um, about a year ago at Baxter Street Camera Club of New York. And that work also won the Aperture Portfolio Prize last year. Um, so in grad school, I figured out how to use a longstanding obsession with history as inspiration for my work. And that happened when I came across some old Timothy O'Sullivan and Carlton Watkins prints um, at the Yale University Art Gallery. Uh, and any of you who've seen those prints in person, um, they're really stunning. They're a lot more visceral and engaging in person than in photo history textbooks or like on the Met website. Um, so if you have an opportunity to see them in person, I highly recommend it. Um, I had definitely seen them before, probably in my undergrad education in like an art history class, but they had never really struck me until I saw them in person. And um, I think it was probably a combination of just where I was with my work and my practice. It was like, I think coming to the end of my second semester in grad school and I was like totally lost and miserable and really just kind of thinking about ways to, um, kind of burn it all down and build it back up again, really kind of thinking about the nuts and bolts of photography and like why I do it and why I care about it and what I'm attracted to, um, as opposed to over intellectualizing everything. And so I saw those prints and there was something about the blacks that I found really fascinating. In addition to the way that the cameras, which then would have been large format cameras with glass plates, I'm pretty sure, um, the way that those materials describe the Western landscapes, I thought on a formal level was really attractive. Um, but then there was also this conceptual thing happening in the work. Um, so mind you, this is like, this is like the spring of 2017, the 2016 election had just happened. And so there was at least for me, a lot of thinking about like, well, what makes America, America? How has it been mythologized in various ways to suit various people's ends? And the way that that kind of thinking, um, the way that I was doing that kind of thinking in combination with seeing these landscapes, which have very much uh, historically worked to, to mythologize the American landscape as a place that is free of indigenous people uh, and shows no markers of slave labor or any people of color or the contributions of any people of color. Uh, it's just sort of this pristine landscape, right? That's presented to you uh, for the taking as available for the taking, but only if you're a particular person, meaning a white landowning male, right? 
So I was thinking about all of these things, seeing these pictures, and um, another thing, this book was really helpful. It's um, picturing America's national parks. It's like an aperture coffee table book, but it's really, really good at tracing the parallels between the like it, advent of photography as a medium and as an art form alongside the invention of the National Park Service um, and how they kind of, how photography was like in, totally important, integral to the formation of the National Park Service. So if you're interested in, in landscapes and like park stuff and sort of in the ways that the American landscape has been depicted, uh, definitely check this book out. It's on sale, I think. <laughs> um, so looking at that book um, and just sort of thinking about all of that that I just mentioned, uh, a new question arose for me in my work um, in term, and the question was who gets to decide what views of, and perspectives are important and how are those ideas established by a few, by few people and maintained by many. Um, and another thing, one thing that book, oh, for some reason I, oh, there we go, there's the book. <laughs> that, that's a much nicer version than the one that I have. Um, so here are some pictures. And if you're asking yourself right now, if I took these with my phone, the answer is yes. <laughs> and that's why they look like that, but I was in a pinch. So um, there's not very good scans of it online. So I just took some quick pictures with my phone. Um, but the thing that the book is really good at is showing very clearly how these images that were taken in the late 19th century by Timothy O'Sullivan and Carlton Watkins and all those guys, how those, those guys, what they decided was the perfect view of something like El Capitan, for, for instance, that they're deciding that like in 18 whatever, 60 something, after that, anytime you would purchase like a postcard or like a stereoscope of the area, it would be basically based on the views that they had predetermined. It's like no one thought about a different way to see the landscape. And I thought that that was such a crazy, I thought it was totally crazy, but I also thought it was a really interesting metaphor for the way that we're just kind of like handed these histories and we don't consider, um, you know, we don't consider the baggage or what the end goal of the person who's giving us the history. We don't think about any of that. We just sort of take it to be true. Um, so I just thought, you know, especially after Donald Trump got elected and fake news, it just all seemed very it just worked, it just worked in my head at the time. So, so here's a really good example in the book of like a particular view of Old Faithful and it just like it's repeated, right? By different photographers at different times, amateurs, professionals, whatever, crazy. And then here's another, so crazy. It's like the same, it's the same picture, mind boggling. So I thought that was really fascinating. Um, and then I started making my own work. So this is my picture. Um, so that thinking about landscape uh, transformed into, in addition to thinking about landscape, thinking about monuments and artifacts of antiquity and museums, because I find that those also, you know, you walk into any given museum, this is the um, Yale University Art Gallery still, and you're faced with all of these sort of artifacts and they do their best to provide context, but the context of the goals of the curatorial department are never really made clear. And the context of the goals of the history of the curatorial department, like they don't really talk about that stuff. And so this picture is probably the most direct picture of the bunch uh, because it shows, you know, the actual labor, the physical labor um, that is, that we have to go through, you know, and kind of alludes to the mental labor and emotional labor of maintaining ideals and values and histories that maybe don't serve us that well. Um, so that's what this picture is about. So the whole project just kind of became a general critique of what becomes historicized and what doesn't. Um, and a critique of what historical monuments are important enough to be recorded and monumentalized and what monuments are, are not. Um, and so again, I was photographing objects in museums, landscapes of historical significance, landscapes of um, 
uh, economic significance as well. Like I photographed a copper mine um, and let's see, formally that manifested or formally I was taking very dark and contrasty images. And for me, that was a visual way to refer to not only Carlton Watkins and the sort of blacks in that work um, and, and point to his visual language and like acknowledge the fact that I was using his visual language but to do something else. Um, but it also, the darkness is also a, a visual way to refer to aspects of history that are left to fall into darkness and obscurity, kind of cliche, but whatever. Like sometimes um, it's good to be obvious, like especially these days, I think it's good to speak as clearly as possible. And in this case, I think using the darks was actually really helpful. Um, if I had let my intellectual side win that argument, I probably wouldn't have done it because I probably would have convinced myself that it was corny, but I think it actually worked. So <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I did it. Um, and another formal interest. So yeah, this is a really good example of like literally using black to obscure a bust in a museum that like, I don't really need, I feel like I don't need to know about anymore <laughs> or like I would rather know about someone else. Um, so, Another formal interest of mine in this work was looking at land and landscape as the physical material for the monuments that I was photographing. So there was an attempt to connect the like material of the landscape. So like the rocky sort of earthy landscape with, um, and then here's another landscape. That's the copper mine, excuse me. Um, an attempt to connect like that sort of texture, the visceral quality, thinking about earth as a material, and um, then the, the monuments and the busts themselves. Um, and also kind of a reference to archeological digs and like digging through the earth for things, digging for facts, digging for histories. Um, so yeah, that's that work. Um, I have mixed feelings about it now, <laughs> even though it was really important for me to make that work. Um, I I think I stopped doing it because it felt like it was too broad of an institutional critique, too much too broad um, of just like a general critique of history. Like I remember in one crit in school, someone asked me like who the bus were. And I was like, I don't know. And in realizing that like, I didn't care that I didn't know. On the one hand, it's like, well, that is kind of a part of the work is to like ignore this established history, but also I need you need to be more specific. So after I made this, the sort of, um, uh, I learned a lot from it. I learned how to use, you know, my interest in history. I learned all these things. I learned about what I really care about formally, um, which I think is light and shadow. It's very simple at the end of the day. Um, and I kind of use that information to help me figure out what my next project would be. I think it can be really helpful to look at work that you've done and be really honest with yourself and um, just sort of ask yourself, well, what is it about this that I don't like? What do I wish I could do? Do I wanna be more specific? Do I want more people? Do I want the work to be less intellectual? Do I want the work to be warmer? Um, do I want the work to not just refer to human touch and human presence, but actually have that. Those were all of the things that I wanted after doing this. And so I think like, obviously, you know, with anyone who's here, anyone who's watching this right now, like you'll have your own set of questions or your own list of demands for yourself based on your work. But I think it can be very good to, to have a list of demands based on what you've previously done. It can be a really good guide um, to figure out what to do next. So for me, um, I wanted to focus on a much more specific history, you know, everything that I just said. And I also wanted to work from um, lived experience, my lived experience, from an acknowledged experience or my identity, as opposed to hiding behind like big ideas about history and theory. Um, I think my natural state of being is like overly intellectual. And so it can be hard for me to work from personal experience. But I think now that I... I'm trying to cultivate that more and more. It's only served to help the work and actually helped me to get the work to where I want it to be. So all of that being said, I um, 
am a daughter of the Great Migration, uh, I guess is a way that you could put it. My grandfather, my maternal grandfather moved from Denton, Texas to Los Angeles, California um, in the mid fifties when he was like 12. He moved with his dad and his older brother. Um, and actually his dad went first and then his older brother went and his older brother's job was to report back. And he reported back that it was actually pretty okay. <laughs> so then my grandfather went and um, my, my mother's mother, I think went from Texas to Michigan and then from Michigan to Los Angeles. And so they both met in LA in the early 60s, had my mom, she stayed in LA, here I am. Um, and yeah, so family history, I think is something that is interesting to a lot of people. Like I think it's totally natural to be, or like expected to be interested in your family prior to your existence because in a lot of ways, every little decision that was made, um, perhaps if a different decision had been made, like even something as small as catching a late bus, you might not be here. <laughs> so I think it's really fascinating. And I think it, you know, a lot of people are fascinated by family history. It, it's an entire industry, obviously 23andMe, like I know that I'm not the only person that's interested in this photographer or not. Um, I had just never considered it as available information for my work. And again, I think that is because in a lot of cases I lead with the intellectual as opposed to the feeling and the lived experience, but I have finally learned how to not do that. I think I'm sure it's something that I'm going to have to work on, but <laughs> um, so I, because of my own family's sort of place in the great migration um, and because of this book, The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson, which was published about 10 years ago, because of those two things, or, you know, very much inspired by those two things, I did my next group of pictures. Um, and just for anyone who doesn't know, let's see, the Great Migration, like the Wikipedia version, the neat version is that it was the movement of 6 million Black Americans um, from the South to the North, Midwest, West, uh, from around 1916 to 1970. Obviously migration can't be bookended like that. And even my own dad who, my, my dad's family still lives in the South. He, he's from Georgia and moved out to LA in like the mid eighties. And I would consider that part of the migration. And actually he moved back to Georgia. So and there's this whole like reverse migration thing happening, which is very interesting. Um, I don't think he likes it very much, but um, one thing that I will say with this work is that I, in no means do I mean to like mythologize the North and the West and the Midwest as these sort of like idyllic places that were free of Jim Crow. We all know that that's not the case. And it's very important to not act like, like Jim Crow. I mean, Jim Crow is still happening, period. So I just, it's important to me to make it clear that it's not that I'm, saying these places were better, it's more an investigation of the macro and the micro of the Great Migration, um, you know, sort of thinking about how, how all of these intimate things, all of these intimate events were occurring, these very personal, very important decisions, intimate decisions were being made about people's lives and their futures, like on a very small scale, but it was also happening on this huge, huge scale. And I just think that sort of, um, I try to cultivate that tension between the macro and the micro in the work. And I think I, I did that actually in the old work. It just was more formal. Whereas with this work, it's formal and conceptual. Um, yeah, so, okay. So that's that first picture. Uh, let's see, blah, blah, blah. Oh yeah, so so for this work, um, in being in, like having been inspired by the Great Migration, reading Isabel Wilkerson's book, which like very deftly moves from uh, the personal stories of four specific people, where they were born, um, what they did, why they decided to leave, how they left, where they went, what happened once they got there. Uh, she weaves those like four personal narratives, interweaves them with these like broad um, sort of 
place setting. Like there's a lot of numbers and facts. It's very, very well researched. It's very intense, but it's really lovely again, just to see how she sort of maneuvers between the intimate and the grand, the macro and the micro. Um, so I started making this work by focusing on uh, black neighborhoods in LA, specifically the neighborhoods that I grew up in, which would be Baldwin Hills, Crenshaw, and Inglewood. Um, those neighborhoods, for any of you who are in LA right now or are familiar, you will know that those neighborhoods have been predominantly black since the 1960s. Um, and recently I've made pictures in Brooklyn and in New Jersey. Um, so the work definitely isn't specifically about LA, but of course, like, in order for me to start from a lived experience, like I had to start from my lived experience. Um, and I also love the light in LA, so I started there. Um, let's see, I would love to photograph people in Philadelphia, so definitely be in touch. <laughs> Maybe you know anyone uh, in Philly, you know, whose family is a family of the Great Migration, I'm sure someone here does, so yeah, definitely be in touch. Um, the general idea, though, of the work is to focus on Black neighborhoods. Um, I've always been fascinated by urban design um, and the way that cities are built and maintained and the sort of like invisible sort of barriers between neighborhoods. And it's not so much about, I mean, obviously, like we can have a conversation about redlining and whatever, and that's sort of inherently a part of the work, but I'm I'm more interested in talking about like why my favorite barbecue place in LA has the kind of barbecue that they have. It's because it's they're from Texas and it's Texas barbecue. Like for me, it's it's much more about like the everyday quotidian lived experience of how a black neighborhood gets to be a black neighborhood and how special of a place it is. Um, I think when I was a kid, I didn't understand that, but now sort of thinking about the broader history it's like, it's endlessly fascinating to me, black neighborhoods and sort of the daily life that happens in them in different cities um, and how they got to be that way. Um, so let's see, where am I? Do, 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 do. Oh, uh, so these are four by five. This is for all you nerds out there. <laughs> these are four by five uh, color. Actually, I like to shoot color and then make them black and white because I feel like I have more control tonally because then I scan them um, on an Emicon ideally. And they're digitally printed at Griffin Editions in Brooklyn. They're wonderful. I can't recommend working with them enough. Um, they're really good at what they do. I am a horrible printer, so I don't. It would be a, a travesty if I printed these. <laughs> um, I'm much more interested in like the taking of the pictures and like the setting things up and, and stuff like that. Um, it's also mostly natural light because I really just can't handle artificial lights and I am trying, but it's just, I love the sun because I can see it. And it's, it's really interesting to work with the sun as a kind of metaphorical character in the work, like a presence in the work, especially in a place like LA where the light and the sun do make up such a big presence. So, there's conceptual reasons, but also just I prefer sunlight and I just am really bad at artificial light. So let's see. Okay, here we go. Um, so uh, I focused on Black neighborhoods and the homes and the people in those neighborhoods as their own kinds of museums. So remember in my work before, I was kind of, I was photographing in museums attempting, attempting to do an institutional critique. But then I think I kind of started to understand that really I was just perpetuating the images that I was trying to critique. And so one, one of my list of demands for this was to make my own museum, like what would be in my own museum? And it would be Inglewood or like a house in Inglewood or Baldwin Hills. And so I approached that um, with that in mind. And uh, I really consider these homes and these neighborhoods institutions in their own right for molding those living there and kids growing up there like I did. So the photos are made in the homes of family and family friends and acquaintances and total strangers uh, who I scouted for the project. Um, it's not about my family. It's not about any particular family. And it, you can't even really, I, I wouldn't say it was even really a documentary project about the Great Migration. It's definitely not. Um, it's just, I really saw that as a jumping off point to imagine um, 
imagine things from my memory, from my childhood, um, and even sort of speculate and just sort of like picture the neighborhoods in the way that I feel them and in the way that I think about them and in the way that I see them. I'm not interested in documentary <laughs> and I firmly situate the work outside of it. Um, the pictures themselves, I make them, oops, I make them um, in a way that's like somewhere between observation and construction. So, you know, working with a four by five obviously is very slow. And um, for me, it really helps to like, like construct the image as opposed to just like shooting, shooting, shooting and like taking. Um, there's something about four by five, I think, it probably has something to do with being able to see with both of my eyes and and like put a picture together. Um, so that's what I'm doing. I'm like putting these pictures together. They're not really documents. Um, well, I guess they're documents, but they're not documentary. Um, let's see. Formally, I wanted these pictures to work a bit more in like um, a spumato range of tones, um, which is like a hazy range of tone and light. Um, my grad school work leaned a lot more towards the chiaroscuro, which is like heavy, heavy blacks. I'm sure many of you have seen like Caravaggio. If you think about how dark the darks are in his paintings and how there's like these sort of shafts of light that illuminate the action. That was really the way that I approached the grad school work formally. Um, and I started to think that that was a bit of a formal crutch. So that was another one of my list of demands was to like expand my tonal range, but also retain blacks because I think like I like having a lot of blacks in pictures because I like the kind of conversation and the way that when you have a lot of black area in your work um it's interesting the way that you then talk about blackness like it, I just um I think it's a really beautiful way to talk about formal blackness and conceptual blackness by having literal blackness in the pictures as a space of infinite possibility because you can't see anything there. You don't know what's going on. Um, so yeah, black is still very important, but more grays. Uh, let's see. So that's a pretty good example of like a sfumato picture. Um, I also with this, these pictures wanted to be more active as a photographer. I think in the past I did rely a lot more on observation and that like wasn't enough for me anymore. Um, and so it's, like that, it's like what I was talking about with constructing. And again, I really think the four by five helps me to do that quite a bit. Um, it's like you set the camera and you can kind of like move around and move things and really take everything in and take your time. Like there's something about that way of working that really works for me. And now when I shoot digital, which I still do, cause I'm not like a snob. <laughs> I just, I like four by five because it, because it makes me see in a different way. And I like the tones, but when I shoot editorial work, I shoot it digitally because that is just easier. Um, and I feel like I, like working with 4x5 for one, like once or twice, I feel like it changes you. And I think because I work with it in my own work, I'm able to take the way that I use 4x5 and apply it to other kinds of media. So yeah, I mean, I'm not like a film stan at all, <laughs> but I, um, you know, I do think that the way the camera forces you to see the world is very useful and can be applied to other kinds of cameras and other media. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. I heard I had to watch like a BBC documentary for one of because I assigned it to one of my classes. <laughs> Hopefully some of the students are here. <laughs> and uh, I was watching the, the sections that we were supposed to watch today. And um, I'm not a I'm not a fan of Joel Meyerowitz like at all, but he said this really great quote, um, or maybe it was someone else. They said, uh, what did they say? Oh, photography may look like the facts, but it's not the facts. And like it may have a documentary aesthetic, but it's not documentary. And I thought that was really good. Like it's so funny the way that people just automatically take black and white pictures as the facts, and I they're not. So. That's like super, super important to remember, I think, with this work. So there's another picture. Um, this picture is super, super important because I feel like in addition to speaking to the very specific kind of um, black glamour, it also speaks to like Hollywood, like it feels very noir. It reminds me of Verdict, her bump and curl. That's a bump and curl hairdo for anyone who doesn't know. Um, but, you know, it's like, 
yeah, it's a very special hairdo to me. Um, it reminds me of Vertigo. The, there's like, a, she's got like a little swoop and it really reminds me of Vertigo. Um, yeah, so in some ways, like I was saying, it points to this kind of, you know, black glamour, but it also points to the location as Los Angeles. And um, I'm really interested in making pictures that refer to landscape or that can locate you in a specific landscape without being super obvious. So like, instead of taking a picture of the Hollywood sign, this picture functions, I think for me, in the way a picture that a, the, a picture of the Hollywood sign would. Um, it's much more about the kinds of things that we associate with LA, the kind of feeling that LA has um, on a body that I think we unfortunately don't see that often. So yeah, this is like an important picture to me. And honestly, actually, I take that back. This was the person that I grew, I am intimately familiar with this person, <laughs> not in like, um, I don't actually know her, like I scouted her for the work. So I know her for the purpose of this work, but like conceptually, this is a person that I am intimately familiar with, this kind of woman. And so I see her a lot. She is big in my life, <laughs> but um, I do think that I would like to see more of her and that kind of woman out in the world. So I'm, I'm putting this picture out there. Uh, yeah, let's see. So I also have started including these small color photos that I made at a family reunion, a 2012 family reunion. Um, I went with my, so my grandfather's family does a reunion every two years in Denton and they would have had one this year, obviously that was canceled, but I went with him in 2012 and I brought like an old 35 millimeter camera with me. And um, I had just graduated from art school and I was like really confused and I didn't know what I was doing, but I was like, well, I'll just go because this is a lot of family that I haven't met yet. And like, I always like going to new places. I think travel and like my body, like moving my body through space is an integral part to the way that I make my work. So if I have an opportunity to go somewhere or see some place new or be in a place, then I'm going to do it. Um, I guess you could call me like an in the world photographer because um, I make all of my pictures out in the world and I'd like to go on, you know, sort of journeys to photograph. Um, but anyway, um, so yeah, I made all these pictures and I didn't know what to do with them. I was a very different photographer at the time, very different artist. I did not like them. <laughs> um, and so I had them developed um, and I just scanned them and I kind of just let them sit in my heart in a hard drive or, you know, wherever. Um, also after I had them developed, I realized that they, the, the lens had fungus in it. And so the pictures themselves have this yellow cast. That's not like from interior tungsten lighting. It's from fungus. So I just really, I was like, I, I can't use it. So this summer when I was stuck inside, just like everyone else and like, not really sure what to do, not really willing to travel. Um, I rediscovered them on my, on my hard drive and it was really interesting to see this work that I had made at a family reunion that was also very much about migration, but about going back. Um, it was so interesting to find it uh, and to reevaluate it because I think when I made it, I, I didn't know what I was doing and I certainly couldn't name it. But in the past year and a half or whatever of working on the big black and white pictures, I've been able to name what I care about uh, in my work in a way that I haven't before. And so finding these seeds that I had planted was like amazing. Um, so I have a lot of them. I think it's really important to work with care with archival images because a lot of people think archive means important and it doesn't. <laughs> um, and so for me, it was like very important that I worked with care, like I love the work of Carmen Winnant um, and she works so, she's so smart. She's so smart the way she works with archival images and just sort of thinking about that work, the way Dina Lawson works with archival images, I was like, okay, well, I have to be really um, smart about this um, and maybe even leave some stuff on the table, which was advice that I welcomed <laughs> from someone else. So I honed in on a few images. Uh, this was one of them. And it was really just like a formal intuitive thing. Like I just, I love the shape of her hat and I love her big smile. 
Um, and I love how the shape of the hat is mimicked in the smile. I also love how it is a picture that someone would have in their home. So to have it in my work amongst photos of homes that are like very formal and like, you know, in some ways maybe scream art photography, I thought it was nice to have things that felt a little more warm. So let's see, this is a picture that I made in New Jersey, actually. Um, I like to do different kinds of pictures. Um, and now with the inclusion of the archival, that's like another layer, but I like to do portraits. I like to do, or like things that are portraiture adjacent. Um, and I like to do landscapes and I like to do things that are more abstract. I'm not really the kind of photographer to only work in one way at one time because I get bored pretty quickly, but I think what that helps me do is create a kind of a friction amongst my pictures where in having different kinds of pictures, new meaning can be made like in the friction between them. So instead of having a bunch of landscapes or a bunch of portraits or a bunch of pictures of objects or abstractions, having all of that, it like, it helps to show the world that I'm photographing as complicated as it actually is. And then I do think that there is more meaning to be made amongst the difference than amongst, than amongst the kind of homogeneity, uh, homogeneity. I'm always, someone, my partner is always correcting me on how I say that, so I'm never sure, but <laughs> I said it both ways, so you can pick one. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Um, here's another picture from the family reunion. I like this picture was shocking to me to find because I like, I would bet money that the 22 year old, like I was shocked that the 22 year old me made this. Like, I don't think she was interested in that kind of a formal arrangement, all of the negative space, like the out of focus shoes, the like weird flatness of it. Now I'm like very much here for it, but then I really think I would have been like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, why are you photographing their shoes? This picture doesn't make any sense. Like it's not, there's nothing in the middle, like everything's cut off, but now it does all of the things that I think I strive to do. And maybe the most important thing being surprise. Like it really is a surprising image to me. And, um, I'm surprised that I made it. And I think like, ultimately I just strive to surprise myself with what I do. Um, so yeah, that was like very much a discovery. I love the little toe hanging off the sandal. It's so good. <laughs> it's like, I can talk about this picture as if I didn't make it because I basically didn't like 22 year old me did. And I'm just sort of like, I cannot believe that I, that she, that I made that. Um, Anyway, so now I'm sort of starting to think about this project less and less as a project and more just as like each picture being its own individual thing, uh, which I'm excited about because I think photographers can get really bogged down by the idea of projects. I know that I have, and it's taken me a, a long time to figure out how to just, how to not do that, um, how to really work picture by picture and just kind of you know, how to understand um, this new way of seeing that I have cultivated by doing this work as a way of seeing, not like a project. Like the way that I made this work, I think is really reflective of, again, not a project, but a way of seeing, a way of being in the world, um, a way of thinking about the world. Uh, and that's really exciting for me. Um, Someone else in grad school said to me once that like, cause I would get this critique a lot that I was doing these projects and they were like, well, are you a photo editor or are you an artist? And it's a good question. <laughs> it's something to remember. I'm not a photo editor. I just like, I'm just making the work. So, you know, I, I think it's really important to not like pen yourself in too much. I mean, you don't want to be all over the place but maybe you kind of do because then you can see what comes up and. I think if you actually do the groundwork, then there will be through lines. Um, you just have to actually do the work. Uh, this picture is a picture I never would have taken if I wasn't using four by five. I would bet money on that. Because again, it's like the construction of the image. Like this was actually the first picture I made in this whole project, I think in July of 2019. And um, 
I was like, I was in the garage uh, and I was just sort of sitting there and I think I was really focused on the picture on the back wall and the bike and just kind of like thinking about it and like thinking about the negative space. When you work in four by five, you have time to do all this stuff because you set the camera up and you're like, well, I set it up. So I'm going to take a picture. <laughs> I'm not he leaving here without a picture. So I was like thinking, thinking, thinking. And um, I don't often share this with people, but that's my grandfather, Charles. <laughs> and he, I love working with him um, because he's, I mean, he's used to me taking pictures. I've been taking pictures since I was a teenager. Um, and he humors me because I mean, was his only granddaughter. <laughs> so he was like wandering around somewhere because he also um, likes to take me to my shoots <laughs> in LA because a lot of the people I photograph are people that he knows or family or whatever. And he like is convinced that I don't remember how to go anywhere. So he likes to take me. So we were at his sister-in-law's house and I was like trying to take this picture and um, I was noticing, I was starting to notice how beautiful the, the like out of focus rendering of the chair was. So if you look just below the, his hand that's closest to us in the foreground, it's, it's like resting on um, like a chair thing, a chair arm. Um, and that sort of the swerve, the swirl of it just felt so like suburban and domestic and like, the out of focus of it was just so beautiful, um, but it still felt, the chair was empty and it just was like, Ugh, I just don't know what to do. So he was like wandering around and I was like, can you come and sit in this chair for a second? I just wanna see something. And he did. And I was like, oh my God, that's so crazy. Like I, I could have never planned anything like that. It was just a combination of like, being really rigorous with like finding something, but also being very patient with seeing like how the world, how I could construct the world that was simultaneously unfolding in front of my camera. Um, and again, like I really don't think I ever would have taken a picture like this if I wasn't using four by five because the, I mean, it's, it's magical. It's a magical experience to be under the blanket or in my case, it's a coat because I, always forget to get the blanket um and just to see the face and to see how he was cut off it just was like I had never really done anything like that before um and again I 100% think because it was four by five um so yeah how am I doing on time uh you are at um you got you got 13 minutes left oh, okay I'm gonna try to go <laughs> fast I've been talking a lot I usually stay on track. It was it's freewheeling. I love listening to you. So carry on. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, sorry for anyone who's like, oh, so sophomoric. <laughs> anyway, um, let's see. Blah, blah, blah. Da, 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 da. I already said that. Oh, okay. So here's something important to say. So like I said, none of the pictures are explicitly about the Great Migration. Um, and I'm not making a documentary project, I'm not interested in making a documentary project. Great Migration was the jumping off point, but I really, really prefer to take a more poetic approach. Um, though, you know, the visual language is like, again, documentary aesthetic, it's like, it's not facts, it's just an aesthetic. Um, my interests lean a lot more towards ideas and questions about how visual culture um, travels over space and time and how it's maintained and how history shows up in everyday life. And like, what are the little, markers of culture that we glom onto, glob, glom, I don't know, uh, that really sort of like set off our emotions, right? Like this picture, for example, you know, it's, it's a photograph of sap in my grandfather's backyard. And is this like about the Great Migration? Not really, but it's about a space that I was brought up in that belongs to my grandfather. So in some ways it's like, it's pointing to that, but it's not really about that. It's a lot more about the visceral experience of growing up in these places. So with this picture, it's about like the feeling of the sun on my back in my grandfather's backyard, it's that the little sparkly bits are sap. So like smelling the sap that falls off the tree that he has back there, 
you know, getting it stuck to my shoes or whatever, everything, because it gets stuck to everything. It's about the lived experience of growing up in a Black neighborhood. And for me, this was as much a part of that as going to get the barbecue that I was talking about before. And so it felt important to me to have those kinds of pictures because I feel like when you work from that kind of emotional specificity, um, are people gonna necessarily know what you're referring to or talking about? No, because that's your lived experience, but they will be able to bring their own very personal narrative to the image. I think when you're able to work with that kind of specificity and know what kinds of feelings uh, specifically that you want in your work. This is also another kind of a version of my landscape, um, which is a lot more visceral and abstract way to point to setting and location, um, as opposed to like taking a picture of the Hollywood sign or, you know, what I was kind of talking about before. Oops. Um, like this picture, for example, I love this picture because so many people say that it reminds them of their, like Black people, young Black people will say, it reminds me of my mom's house or my aunt's house or my uncle's house. It, like, there's, it's so familiar and it is crazy to me like how those people who are real people, specific people, um, how just that sort of this idea of them, you know, them and their youngest at their most beautiful, like 23 or whatever in this suburban home that looks like it hasn't been redecorated since 1992. Like I love that people can have that kind of experience with it. Um, and actually, the picture all the way to the left it is me. So <laughs> this is a kind of a self-portrait. Um, let's see. So yeah, I mean, like I was saying, I'm super interested in like very sort of mundane and quotidian aspects of black life. And I think when looking at art photography, we're so used to like, when we think about quotidian and mundane and sort of making the ordinary extraordinary, we think about like Stephen Shore or like Joel Sternfeld um, or new topographics. And those, those photographers and bodies of work, like they picture the American quotidian, but what they picture is overwhelmingly white. And as much as I love new topographics, like do not get me wrong, I love love new topographics. I think that's pretty obvious in the way that I photograph a lot of places. It is really one-sided, just like the critique that I was making in previous work about the kinds of histories that we are told. So it's like I'm borrowing that language, I'm borrowing those aesthetics to do this other thing. Um, let's see. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I love new topographics, but yeah. Uh, so this is another kind of a landscape abstraction about the geographical location of Los Angeles, because the only reason those cracks can exist is because the earth underneath LA is constantly moving, which is why there are earthquakes. Uh, so it's a way for me to point in an abstract way to LA as a place in the world. And um, this is like, I guess it's hard not to see this as coming full circle with the photographs that I made of busts and museums. I mean, it's called bust. Um, again, it was like, I, I really tasked myself with making my own artifacts or recording my own artifacts. Um, and so I made this person into a bust. Um, yeah. So I think that's the last picture from that work. Uh, it was very much inspired by Maya Darren's Meshes of the Afternoon, in addition to new topographics. I love Maya Darren, um, particularly, this, particularly this movie. It is on YouTube, but the score is not right. So don't watch that one. <laughs> you can rent, if you're not boycotting Amazon, you can watch it on Amazon for like $4. You really should. It's very important to see it with the original score which is by a composer named Teji Ito. Like don't watch one of the YouTube versions. They have trash scores and it's a travesty because Maya Darren uh, was amazing. So watch, rent it, and watch it on YouTube or watch it on Amazon. Um, here is a still from that. It's very surreal. It's about, a, it's about like domestic interiority but also her interiority. She's the star of it. 
Um, it's, it's really beautiful. I think it was, yeah, 1943. It's really ahead of its time. It's remarkable. I watch it often. Um, so that's big inspiration. Um, this is a Henry Wessel picture just because I think like, I don't wanna talk about new topic graphics without being specific and being specific about, specific about why I love it. I love this picture. <laughs> it's so crazy it's so crazy look at the light that's insane like it's so good so I think that's really wonderful uh also love this Robert Adams picture that rock looks so odd I was showing it to one of my classes earlier today and I was like getting really excited <laughs> when I was talking about it and we went over so <laughs> um let's see there's another Robert Adams picture which I love because if you look like in the bottom left, uh, you or sorry, the bottom right, you can see like a little bit of house, which totally changes it because it kind of just looks like a bunch of blobs and clouds. But then if you see the little house roof poking out in the bottom right, it like all of a sudden it puts you right in that place of like laying in the backyard in the grass. And it's it's a picture that does what I aspire to have a lot of my pictures do, which is like really put you in a very specific, visceral, emotional place. Have I ever been to this backyard? No, but have I been a kid in a backyard on a sunny day? Yeah. Um, and I think it's really wonderful that this picture can do that. And I like how abstract it is. I also love Carrie James Marshall. I love the way that he depicts black interiors. He's amazing. There was the um, amazing retrospective a few years ago and I saw that at the Met Breuer and it was like totally life-changing and mind-boggling. Um, yeah, national treasure for sure. Uh, I love this living room. I wish I could actually go to it. <laughs> I just really like interiors. I like regular interiors. I don't know why. Also the way that he depicts blackness again, right? It's like, it's endlessly fascinating to me the way that he depicts black skin and seeing the paintings in person is like, it, they're transcendent, he's amazing. And then this painting, which is so crazy because it's entirely black. Um, and then there's some information about it at the bottom of the slide, uh, it depicts the apartment of Fred, Fred Hampton on the, the morning, or let's see, yeah, just before he was shot and killed um, by the Chicago Police Department. Seeing this picture in person is life change or this photograph, this painting in person is life changing. It's, I, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. So <laughs> if you can definitely do, I've never seen anything like it, but it's all black. Like it's, and from what I understand, it's very hard to do black, like to make black when you paint. Um, I hope there aren't any painters in the audience because they probably <laughs> think I, you know, shouldn't talk about that. <laughs> so I don't know what I'm talking about, but. Um, and there's some install shots of the work um, my recent work at, uh, at Baxter Street Camera Club of New York. Install shots, install shots. Oh, 1619. I'm not going to talk about that because I've talked a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, fine. <laughs> but, um, you can, I, I have the link somewhere and, if, and while people are asking questions, please put questions in the chat and stuff. And I'll, um, when I follow up with everybody tomorrow, I'll, I'll send a link so you can look at this PDF if you haven't already. Um, but uh, I would love to, I, it's like two minutes, but we can go over a little bit for some questions. Sorry. No worries. It's, it was <sighs> great. And I just loved watching you nerd out at the end. <laughs> Yeah, I get excited. So cool. I love seeing that. So just, just know, uh, I was you. with you. Um, does anybody have any questions? There was um, lots of uh, uh, praise. Um, oh. And um, ooh, we have one more person. Does anybody have any questions? You can unmute yourself or put it in the chat. I see someone I asked about the barbecue and that's from Phillips on Crenshaw. Sorry, there was a question. <laughs> That was good. Okay, go ahead. Oh, hi. Hi, it's so good to see you. <laughs> yeah, oh, you too. Thank you for that lecture. Oh, Just talking sure. about your work. It's so fantastic. Um, one thing, I'm sorry, I may have missed it, but I think the thing that like 
what I really like love about your work um, although you've talked about capturing like the mundane is this really beautiful way where you um, where like your pictures have this sort of agency through refusal um, whether like the person's turned away or it's um, or it's like the the focus or like out of focus mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering um, yeah like is that something that you think about while you're um, making your work? Mm, good question um, it is it's something that I think about that I have thought about but I actually think those um, those formal devices for refusing agency, they're more about my inability to remember things perfectly. It's more about like the experience of trying to remember my grandmother's face um, and I can't, but I remember her hair like almost perfectly. And it's more about the sort of like, like the act, like what do I see when I act actively visualize those spaces and there's always something missing there's always something fuzzy um and I think in a lot of ways like yeah it's just it's just about how there are things that we really remember so specifically and so perfectly and then other things that we fail to grasp that might come to us in the middle of the night but um yeah just, it's more about the way that memory works but I have also thought about the refusal and the sort of privacy and all of that too. Thank you for the question. Thank you. <laughs> we we can take um, one more question. Does anybody, can any, oh, Karen? Yeah, Lori, I have a question. Um, it was a great, great session. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry that we ran out of time to hear your involvement with the 1619 Project oh. because I read that piece and it was just mind blowing. And if I can find, can you tell us or maybe direct me where I can find out what your involvement was with that project? Something maybe I can, uh, uh, your, your website or something where I can get that information? Sure, so I photographed the cover um, in addition to which, like, I guess I can do, oh, I think I closed out of my, my I remember the cover that I remember it. <laughs> yeah. So I, I photographed, I took that picture and okay. then, um, there was another picture inside a landscape in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, I was commissioned by the New York times magazine, specifically Kathy Ryan, who's the deputy photo director and Jessica Dimson, who's the, um, also maybe assistant deputy. I can't remember. Um, but they commissioned me to do this, this photo essay. I was traveling, I traveled over like nine months um, to different parts of the South. I think as far West as St. Louis, wow. as far North as New Jersey, and as far South as New Orleans, photographing sites of slave trading activity and slave auctions. So um, it's interesting. I have a lot of pictures, but only like 14 have been published. Um, I'm actually going to write about one picture for um, a, a publication in Europe. So watch out for that. Um, but they're on the New York Times website. So if you Google New York Times Magazine 6019 project, it's like, I think my, what I did was the only photo essay. Okay. So it'll come right up. Or if you Google okay. my name with the, it'll come right up. Perfect. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Karen, one of the reasons why I want to share a PDF in my follow-up email tomorrow is there's a paywall. I checked, I checked today as we were getting ready and there was a paywall blocking me from entering um, the, the website. So I just, I'll, I'll, I'll try to find what I can. Um, okay, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Thanks, Lori. I have one more question. I'm really not ready to let you go, Danielle. I hope everybody's <laughs> okay out there. Um, Kate asked, the way you talk about Black in your your um, photographs and other photographs, do you relate to that blackness as a black person? Sorry if that seems obvious, but it seems to me not an obvious relationship. I'm not sure that I understand the question. Would, would this person mind elaborating a little bit? Kate, are you there? Let's see if she's there. Hey, yes, I'm here. Um, I'm think I was gonna start typing, which I'm not that fast at. So, um, 
And I'm not sure how to elaborate on that. Just as you were talking about, um, you're talking about negative space in your photographs and you're talking about uh, light and shadow um, and talking about blackness in the pictures, like the tonality of it in a way that I was getting the impression that you were relating to that blackness in some way that maybe had to do with, you know, being a black person. And, and is that, I, I don't, maybe I was totally pulling that out of the air. I don't know. That's why I asked the question. <laughs> um, um, hmm. Uh, uh, maybe I was totally I don't know did anyone else feel that or like get that or well the way that I, I I'm a black person <laughs> and so the way that I talk about blackness in the work is like yeah I'm in that's the formal and conceptual thing that I was pointing to like it's a formal conversation about blackness but it's also a way to talk about what blackness can do and how in the work it's not like I don't necessarily see blackness as a negative space as much as I see it as a space for possibility. Okay. So totally, and just to be clear, when you, I I was not equating when you were talking about negative space and black space, but I think you you were interestingly pointing to light and shadow, and it I just felt like there was a relating going on to it in a way that. Um, was interesting to me. That's all. So, so yeah, no, that's intentional. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, I just uh, dare I ask one last question um, about the archive and how it's not important. Can you can you can you riff on that a little bit? Oh yeah, sure. Well, it's not that the archive is not important. It's just that I think that people are really seduced by archives, like. There's a whole, there's a particular kind of person who like goes to flea markets and buys old pictures and things that are people that they don't know. Like there is some thing about archives that feel special to people. Maybe it's nostalgia, I'm not really sure. Um, but all of that being said, I just think that I think that a lot of people when they're working with archive because it automatically feels like a special thing, fail to give it the kind of care that it deserves, especially when relating it to their own work. And so for me, it was important to not just feel like, ooh, these are old and like, that's interesting. And it was, it's, it was really important to actually see, no, how do these work? Like just them being old is not enough. Just them representing a place that is no longer in existence in that way that's not enough. Like there needs to be more care and more thought if I'm gonna work with that material. So yeah, does that answer, does that make sense? That was great, thank you. I, I, I'm, yeah, I, I, I love, uh, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about the archive and I'm, I just wanted to hear um, a little bit more from you on that one, thank you. Um, I think if it's okay, we have to say that that's it y'all. Um, <laughs> we try to keep it to an, an hour to respect everyone's time. It was a really great evening. I, I appreciate it so much. I just thank you, Danielle, and um, hope to see you back in this space one time soon. That would be great. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, because obviously there's, there's lots more to talk about. And I'm just going to sort of say thank you, everyone. Next week, Adama Delphine uh, Fawundu is going to be speaking, um, presenting her work. Please come back. It's going to be another fabulous night. Um, and uh, hope to see you soon. Yeah, thank, I wanna echo, thank you, Danielle, for being here and taking the time to, to speak with us. Um, it was really fantastic, the historical point of view of your work. So I really enjoyed seeing the, the length of your practice. And I wanna thank, thank everyone you. else for being here. Um, in these times, it's really important to see community and seeing you all here on Thursday nights is just, um, a bright spot in the week. So thank you. Thank you. And I see all my friends out there. It is so good to see your faces and I can't wait to see them in person. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>